Why are we not talking about sarcopenic obesity? This is Dr. Jeetan Bendor for Physician Perspectives. The obvious question is, what is sarcopenic obesity? So, let's give sarcopenic obesity some perspective. Let's start by defining it. So, here is a consensus statement published by the European Society for Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism, ESPEN, and the European Association for the Study of Obesity, EASO, that was published in Feb 2022. So, sarcopenic obesity is sarcopenia and obesity, characterized by the combination of obesity, defined by high body fat percentage, and sarcopenia, defined as low skeletal muscle mass, accompanied by low muscle function. Sarcopenic obesity needs to be considered as a unique clinical condition, different from obesity or sarcopenia alone. This is very important. And this is due to the existence of bidirectional pathogenic interaction between body fat mass accumulation and loss of skeletal mass, muscle and function, as well as the negative clinical interactions between obesity and sarcopenia that leads to a synergistically higher risk of metabolic disease and functional impairment. So why bother about sarcopenic obesity? Because in my opinion, sarcopenic obesity is a far more sinister form of obesity than without the sarcopenia bit. So here is a paper published recently in 2021, The Role of Sarcopenic Obesity in Cancer and Cardiovascular Disease. The authors talk about sarcopenic obesity being a relatively new terminology, which is right, and that there are not many, you know, available evidence on the role of sarcopenic obesity at least in cancer and CVD or cardiovascular disease. So this review, in this review they try to describe the pathophysiological aspects and the clinical and epidemiological evidence on the role of sarcopenic obesity related to the occurrence and mortality risk of various types of cancer and cardiovascular disease. So, here the authors present main pathophysiological mechanisms shared in developing cardiovascular disease and cancer in individuals with sarcopenic obesity. At the top layer, you're looking at unhealthy lifestyle, basically, um, sedentary behavior, unhealthy di un diet or food habits, and aging that happens um, you know, in parallel. Now, sedentary behavior and unhealthy um, diet or food uh, plants affect the young and adolescents. This is very important because we see oh, sarcopenic obesity in young age as well. I'll show you a paper after this. Leads on to the next big challenge which is sarcopenic obesity where you have adiposity and muscle loss which basically causes an imbalance in myokines and adipokines. Myokines being uh, challenges like reduction in irisin and IL-15, increase in myostatin, and at the, at the adipokines end, you have reduction in adiponectin, but an increase in leptin. Leptin plays a very important role here. Um, I'm sure there'll be more papers, and I will present many more papers if I can find them on time, uh, on leptin and its role in obesity, as well as energy balance, including managing insulin. So you have factors like IL-6 going up again. The next layer basically are the functional layer where you see proteolysis, insulin resistance popping up, lipotoxicity and atherogenesis causing an imbalance again in some of the hormones and ending up with the, almost the last layer where you have a tumor progression. You have a reduction in immunity. You have angiogenesis, increase in blood pressure, cardiomyocyte, cardiomyocyte apoptosis, with the last layer being cancers and cardiovascular disease. But pretty much you can take this model and apply it to pretty much every challenge that can happen with sarcopenic obesity. In this table, the authors list the publications that report the prevalence of sarcopenic obesity in cancers of the digestive system, endocrine system, the genitourinary system and the integumentary system. And what is noticed is that the prevalence of sarcopenic obesity in these cancers are certainly not low. 
The authors also present a table with data from published papers on clinical implications and survival in adults and older adults with cancer and sarcopenic obesity, showing functional outcome, clinical and surgical outcomes, for example, poorer prognostic values compared to normal BMI, higher hospital readmission than non-sarcopenic obesity patients, higher complication rates, and mortality and survival outcomes as in uh, sarcopenic obesity associated with smaller survival rates, sarcopenic, uh, sarcopenic obesity also associated with increased mortality and so on. Here is a not so recent publication on 14,000 subjects on sarcopenic obesity and insulin resistance. The authors claim that sarcopenic obesity was strongly associated with increased insulin resistance and dysglycemia. And they also claim that sarcopenic obese individuals had significantly higher HOMA IR and HbA1c levels than obese individuals without sarcopenia, confirming their hypothesis that the combination of sarcopenia and obesity leads to more severe insulin resistance and dysglycemia. So what does sarcopenic obesity look like? Compare these two images, part A and B. Part A is where you have just right subcutaneous tissue, denoted as light gray areas, which is fat. And compare that to part B, which has a lot more of this light gray areas, which denotes a lot of fat around the muscle as well as within the muscle. Can we diagnose sarcopenic obesity? Yes, absolutely. So I'll refer back to this paper, Definition and Diagnostic Criteria for Sarcopenic Obesity. The ESPEN and EASO group support a list of conditions that should raise clinical suspicion for sarcopenic obesity. And here they are, age above 70 years, chronic diseases such as chronic heart failure, kidney disease, respiratory disease, and so on, including depression, Recent acute disease or nutritional events such as recent hospitalization, major surgery or trauma, recent sustained immobilization or reduced mobility, recent uh, rapid increase in weight for example, or history or complaint of uh, repeated falls, weakness or exhaustion and fatigability. So the diagnostic procedure for the assessment of sarcopenic obesity involves screening, diagnosis or staging. Screening involves the presence of high BMI or waist, waist circumference rather, surrogate parameters for sarcopenia such as clinical symptoms or clinical suspicion. Now both these conditions must be present to proceed with the diagnostic process which involves two steps. First one is altered skeletal muscle function parameters where we should consider strength, muscle strength such as hand grip strength and if muscle functional parameters suggest the presence of sarcopenic obesity the diagnostic process will continue considering body composition where body composition involves increased fat mass or fat percentage and reduced muscle mass assessed by appendicular lean mass adjusted to body weight using a DEXA or total skeletal muscle mass adjusted by weight by using a bioelectrical impedance analysis. Now both altered body composition and altered skeletal muscle functional parameters should be present to assess the presence of sar sarcopenic obesity. Now staging involves two stages. Stages 1 and 2. Stages one, stage 1 has no complications whereas stage Two has a presence of at least one complication attributable to sarcopenic obesity such as metabolic diseases or functional disabilities. Can we manage sarcopenic obesity? Absolutely. First we need to know what is causing the sarcopenia and obesity and once we know that here are some of the approved therapies in uh, treating the condition. Caloric restriction, more like a food plan. You need to know where your macronutrients are coming from. Aerobic exercises, resistance exercises, very, very, very important to improve skeletal muscle strength and mass. Protein supplementation, very central again to improve muscle mass and strength. Calcium supplementation, vitamin D supplementation. And an important element which is not missed here, that is good sleep. 
I will talk more about the therapies in another video session. Thank you for watching.